Okay, before I start oh, with my last talk, just one minor point concerning the AEM uh, when you apply them to time, temporal asymmetric uh, eigenvector maps. In this case, using AEM or using DBM MEM will get you approximately the same result, but in this case, you don't detrend your data. So Pierre already mentioned it for the AEM. It's also the case for DBMEM if you want to use them on a temporal as uh, descriptors of, uh, of a temporal structure. In this case, you leave them. At the, you, you leave your series as it is. You don't detrend it before applying the DBMEM because this is what we are after. after all. Okay. So now I'll go to a topic. That may seem strange. Testing interaction between space and time without replication. Everybody knows that this is not possible. You don't test an interaction when you don't have replication. So uh, this is an idea dev developed by uh, Michel de Caceres and Pierre. Some years ago, I, was, I came after that too, for, for, for various reasons, but at the beginning, when Pierre first explained me, that, or told me that they had devised an idea to do this, I was simply baffled, like everyone should be. And then when he explained me how they, had, uh, they, they, they would proceed, I told them <coughs> they were thieves, robbers. They stole degrees of freedom. Because you need degrees of freedom to test for interaction, and there are no degrees of freedom left if you have no replication. <laughs> so you have to see them somewhere. In the usual case, when you can test interaction, you are in such a situation when, where you have within cell replication, like this. Those uh, replicates give you the necessary degrees of freedom to test for interaction. But in time, in space-time surveys, you usually don't have replication. A usual space-time survey is done this way. So you have the sites, you have a, uh, a region where you have those sites uh, spatially organized in some way, and then you sample them at year one, and then at year two, and at year three, and so on and so forth. But at the level of the site, you don't have replicates. There. The site one is sampled once at time one and once at time two at one, so that actually your ANOVA design looks like this. You have only one observation in each cell, so no replication. So for space, you have in the symbols that I'm going to use, uh, the ones of the paper, I'll show you the paper after that. Uh, S minus 1 degrees of freedom, S being the number of sites, and in time, time number 1, degrees of freedom. And you have uh, the error that has to be, uh, that is, uh, has its uh, S minus 1 uh, times 10 minus 1 degrees of freedom. You have no degree of freedom left for testing the interaction. So there may be interaction, but you cannot test it. It is uh, like it's completely embedded in the error term of the ANOVA. This is a, a, the usual way of thinking of an ANOVA. So how could we spare some degrees of freedom? And the answer could not have been given to you before now because the answer goes back to what we just presented to you uh, this morning. We could, could code space or time and or time, and or interaction more parsimoniously using DBMEM. I told you when uh, I presented the DBMEM to you that for a linear transect, equispace linear transect, that would be time, for instance, in our uh, new situation here, you got approximately half the dBMEM with respect to the number of sites, or here, the number of times. So if we have 10 years of sampling, 
you would get about four or five, normally four, four dBMEMs modeling positive temporal correlation. And this is what interests us, the positive. So instead of modeling the usual, in an ANOVA, of modeling time using dummy variables or simply a factor, which would have, in this example of 10 time points, 9 degrees of freedom, we could use those four dBMEMs instead. So we just spared five degrees of freedom, which is enough. Okay, you just need a couple of them to be able to test interaction. The same holds for space. If you have 100 points, you have 99 degrees of freedom for a usual ANOVA coding as a, as a factor. Space minus S minus 1. But if instead of those, I use the relevant information contained in all, uh, we don't do uh, forward selection here, contained in all DBMEMs modeling uh, positive spatial correlation for a simple example of 100 regularly uh, space, uh, positioned sites, you would get 49 of those DBMEMs instead of those 99 degrees of freedom. So here we just spared 50 degrees of freedom at a time. Wow! This time we have plenty of degrees of freedom to test for our interaction. And that was the idea. So, with this basic idea, several possibilities arise. This is the paper, the original paper about this. It's, of course, available on Pierre Lejean's website. So now, I have said that uh, you could do this for space or for time and for interaction. So, several possibilities arise that are summarized in this figure, in the, which I extracted from the paper just this, this morning, so be patient. You have noticed, or so, certainly noticed over uh, these days, that I never present you the version of uh, uh, the talk that was on the site uh, in the first place, because I'm completely unable to read one without modifying it. And this holds to the last minute, like this morning. So, uh, of course, now, talks uh, up to yesterday are up to date. I mean, everything, you can just re-download my talks. They, are to, uh, they have been updated uh, according to what I have uh, really shown to you. And this will be the case shortly for this one. I mean, it is already, no, uh, I did not uh, put those because I simply d didn't have time. I finished this at uh, 8 for, uh, 8.50 this morning. So uh, in a couple of hours, I have updated this as well. Fine. So, uh, of course, the, uh, there are those different possibilities of coding for space and time, and all of them are summarized here, as in the paper. Starting with the normal one, so the replicated ANOVA, model one here, which is our basis, actually, where you have enough degrees of freedom because you have replication within cell replication, okay? Otherwise, it's the classical ANOVA, but unreplicated, so you don't have the necessary degrees of freedom to test for interaction, and you only can test the main effects do this only if you can reasonably assume that you don't have interaction, otherwise uh, you are in trouble. And after that, you can go to the other possibilities uh, implying those DBMEMs. So you could spare the, a couple of degrees of freedom uh, here in space, in the spatial uh, coding, meaning there you use the DBMEMs, and still keep the temporal uh, factor as it is with a T minus 1 degrees of freedom. So you have spare degrees of freedom. Instead of S minus 1, you have a smaller value that is called U here. And uh, spare degrees of freedom here reflect also in the interaction because the interaction, as you remember, is obtained, the terms are obtained by multiplying uh, the factor for uh, the, the, the main factor between the product of uh, think of, of, uh, of those ones as um, 
Helmut contrast, for instance, but these are now DBMEM, so you multiply them, you get the numbers, the number of, uh, uh, of elements here, or variables here, and, of course, uh, what you have spared here will also reflect itself by a smaller number of variables necessary to call the interaction. So this is one possibility. Uh, actually, there are two here, 3A and 3B, which are mentioned in the help file of the function that I present later. 3A would be this, 3B being keep all the, uh, the normal code, meaning the normal factor for space, but spare some degrees of freedom for time, and then you'd have a gray zone here, a spare degrees of freedom, and a smaller gray uh, zone here. So this would be 3B, uh, okay? Fourth possibility, you <laughs> steal those degrees of freedom for space and time. Okay, so both are coded using DBMEM, and of course the, those. Pro, uh, so here you have saved degrees of freedom, and then uh, doing the problem, making the uh, computing the products here, you save some more here. So you have plenty of degrees of freedom to test for interaction. Could have been stopped there, but then there is still another possibility because. Uh, each time, you, uh, of course, uh, you may read the paper, there have been uh, millions of simulations in each situation for, uh, to see which one was powerful enough to detect or, uh, interaction and, uh, well, type 1 error first. When you first invent a method, you don't test if it really finds out what you are looking at. The first thing you test is whether it doesn't tell you there is something when there is nothing. And this is check for type 1 error. This is the first thing to do when you invent a new method, before verifying if it does what you think it does. Verify it if it has the correct rate of type 1 error, meaning if you set at 5%, uh, your alpha at 5%, it w w should reject H0 uh, falsely 5 out of 100 times of k. Course, you do it over more. And you do this for various levels of alpha, and you verify that it's correct. After that, you go for uh, trying for power, and then you, do, you run your simulations to see if, indeed, you can detect interaction, in this case, when there is one, or a space or a time effect, or both, when there are one, uh, some. Okay? And then, the other possibility here is actually to compute the DBMEMs for space and for time, but to use them only to compute their products here to code for interaction and leave space and time themselves, the main effects alone, as their Helmert, uh, Helmert codings or what well, the fact is. Okay? So you spare those degrees of freedom during this computation, so this term and this one are, are the same, except that here we have brought back uh, the, the normal coding of the main effects here. And then there is that problem, if you uh, remember, that when you have a significant interaction, you are in trouble to, ex to interpret the test of the main factor. Actually, you don't, okay? You cannot, uh, you have to slice them and uh, through all uh, times, uh, well, you'd have to test for space uh, separately for all, uh, each time and test for time effects uh, for separately for each uh, side, okay? This is the case. So models, the t those two models, 6A and 6B, are actually devoted for that. So you may have a, a possibility of testing globally with uh, what is called a staggered matrix of, uh, uh, of the BMEMs. I don't have time enough to, to, to show you this into, in detail now, but this is a, an, a, a, posterior t uh, an a posterior test in the case we, uh, where you have found a significant interaction. Another way of doing it being to run separate tests, as I just told you, and this correcting for multiple testing. So both uh, ways of doing it are implemented in the function. So to summarize, uh, here I have written what I just explained uh, verbally. Uh, so model one, the standard crossed uh, with replication, model two without, model three, space underfitted, meaning DBMEMs for space, model three B, time underfitted, DBMEMs for time, and 
uh, model. So, so you have the expression, the, the computation of all degrees of freedom are given each time here. Yeah, of course, uh, this comes uh, directly from the paper itself. And space and time undefeated, and model five, where you compute those EBMEMs for space and time, uh, but you just use them to underfit interaction, keeping the helmet, the normal helmet contrast for uh, the main effects. And 6A and 6B, as I just said, are the, those cases where you found a significant interaction and you want to go uh, to the main effects, but of course in a, an appropriate way. There are tons of simulations that uh, Michael has uh, done with Pierre at that time have shown that overall, considering type 1 error and uh, power to detect interaction, because this is the key point here. In testing main effect in such a case, uh, well, you forgot about, forget about the interaction and you test the main effect, but this is dangerous because there may be an interaction uh, in the normal ANOVA and you are not able to see it. And it's not because you don't see it that it doesn't exist. You know, there are small children, when you ask them to hide, they do it this way. They think that if they don't see you, uh, you cannot see them either. So uh, running a simple ANOVA time, uh, space-time ANOVA uh, without replication, they go, oh, I just take the, test the main factors so I don't have to care about the uh, interaction. This is flat wrong, of course, if the, you, you cannot guarantee that there is not one. What is the meaning of a uh, space-time interaction, by the way? Maybe I should have begun with this. Space-time interaction means you can, of course, an interaction is, is always a symmetrical concept. In some cases, it's easier to interpret from one point of view than the other, but generally speaking, it's symmetrical, and it's the case here. Space-time interaction would, for instance, if you are following the stru community structure in a given area across time, uh, the presence of an interaction means, for instance, that the spatial structures varies over time. It's not the same, okay? And this at uh, different sites. And seeing from the other point of view, it may be that for each time, if you have interaction, for each time, the temporal evolution of the community is not the same. You have at least a couple of, of, of sites where community take, doesn't take the same direction or simply uh, doesn't evolve in the same direction as the overall community, the, uh, the, uh, the other ones. So you can see them both, I, either a, a variation in spatial structure over time or variation in, you may have, if you don't have space-time interaction, it would mean, for instance, that the spatial pattern is constant over time, okay? Uh, if you don't have uh, spatial interaction, uh, temporal evolution at each site may exist, but it takes the same direction at every site. If it's, for instance, you mean impoverishing, so interpoverished is everywhere, the same way, same species that disappear or uh, become uh, less abundant and so on, and other ones may take over. Well, in any case, the pattern would evolve the same way everywhere over time. Well, when we have interaction, you may have zones where the patterns evolve in such a direction and other zones where it evolves in another direction. And this is interaction because uh, the way it evolves depends on the place where you are or the reverse, the temporal evolution dep depends when you are or the, the, the spatial pattern depends on what time you are in. Okay? So now, uh, after all those simulations, the recommendation is to use model five. So the one where you compute the DBMEMs for time and space, but you use them only as products to, uh, to, give the, uh, the, to provide the variables for the interaction. Those variables are less than the number uh, that would uh, top off and, uh, and prevent you from using uh, the test. So the simulations have shown that Paramount importance, of course, permut uh, the, the permutation test has correct type 1 error, meaning if you have nothing, no, no interaction, uh, on, uh, and you, random, uh, you, you generate uh, thousands of random situations where there may be space and time uh, structure, temporal structures, but no interaction, and then uh, if 
you set your rejection level at 5%, then every uh, one out of every 20 simulations of av uh, average, or five out of 100, will falsely reject H0. So we'll uh, effectively, uh, this is correct, and this would be correct for every alpha, uh, which is the thing you are supposed to verify. At the time where this paper has been published, uh, uh, Pierre and uh, Michael produced uh, uh, actually a small package containing two functions called STI models and quick STI. Oh yes, there already was a quick STI there. <laughs> uh, but STI in their functions were uppercase. I insist here because uh, now I have uh, made them uh, uh, different. So STI uppercase here, STI here, uh, uppercase. And the package was called STI. This package has not been uh, proposed to the R, the CRAN, R website. So it, it has never been uh, put there. Instead, the package is still distributed as an appendix uh, or a supplement to the paper itself. So you can download it from uh, the, the web page of uh, well, uh, Ecology. It's possible. But at that time, uh, those actually, instead of DB, now I have used the term DBMEM, but the functions that were computed were the PCMs, first generation. And everything was kept, meaning that you had, you had a couple of them modeling ne negative spatial or temporal correlation. Several weeks ago, I rewrote these functions. Started, well, not from the scratch, of course, I just took those functions and replaced uh, the part that computed, that resorted to that old package PCNM or uh, whatever to, to compute the, uh, the, the PCNMs. And I made it dependent to ADE spatial to compute DBMEMs. So now it computes the modern, uh, the, the, <laughs> the, the latest version of DBMEMs. And eventually, this will be integrated in AD spatial itself. I talked about it with uh, Stefan Dre uh, three weeks ago, and he fully agreed. Yes, of course, uh, send me this any time. So of, it, will take a couple of, it will take a couple of months until it is done. But eventually, we'll find those two functions, a, uh, STE models and quick STI, um, in, uh, in, uh, in AD spatial, in a later release of AD uh, spatial. Uh, but in the meantime, these plus internally uh, two other functions that are used to run, for instance, the permutations and so on, uh, are simply two functions that you can source, like the ones you learn to program yourselves. So these are, of course, provided with two days mat uh, materials for the practicals. You just have to source them, and they work. I have tested them on PC and on Mac. So I'll go to uh, an example here using quick STI. Quick STI uh, does automatically following things. It takes your data, it runs, it computes uh, the, the, uh, the STI interaction test using model 5. And then uh, if space or time, are, uh, if interaction is not significant, it can go back to the usual way of testing the main factors, meaning the normal ANOVA, where if you don't have uh, interaction anyway, why go to the trouble of doing something else? But if there is some significant interaction, then it will compute the, 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 the main effects, uh, well, test the main effects using model 6. Okay, the, those one devoted to that special situation when you have interaction and we still want to have an information about the main effects. So it does this all automatically. Uh, in this case, we had, uh, uh, for this real situation, we had a stream, which is uh, along, uh, well, an outflow of a, a lake in the Station de Biologie de Laurentides of uh, Université de Montréal, which is a, a biological station in the forest, in the Laurentian forest. A couple of lakes and rivers and so on, so you can uh, make a lot, lot of, of uh, ecological experiments or traps or everything. So here, there were... Uh, emergence traps, you know, you, you, emergent, you, you, you just, or emergent, emergence, yes. Uh, you put them uh, over the, 
the water, and then the trichoptera, which has uh, which which have aquatic larvae, uh, they hatch, and then they come into those traps, uh, poor guys, and you capture them and you count them, just identify them. Okay, so we have. Uh, you had uh, 56 species, and of course, uh, we run a transformation, a Hellinger transformation. So th there were 22 traps along the stream, and 10 periods. 10 periods of, uh, of uh, was it one? 10 days, eh? Well, it was one. Actually, we had the data for all days, so 100 days. But the variation was so high from, uh, from one day to another that we pulled together 10 days at a time to have 10, uh, 10 time slices. So it was better that way. So uh, the setup has to be built this way. So your data layout has to be this way, meaning you have the species as columns as usual, and you have the blocks of sites and the time coming this way. So all sites here, one, uh, time one, time two, time three, you cannot uh, solve them uh, in another way and provide uh, another vector to say how it is uh, completed. This is a constraint of the method. It simply has been decided this way for sake of simplicity. So just organize it this way and not the reverse or uh, do not mix up times and, and so on and so forth. And then it's really simple. You ask for uh, the analysis by typing quick STI. You, get, you, go, you give your uh, number of um, your, 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 your data matrix, and then you don't give any other matrix. You simply tell the method how many sites and how many times it has, so 22 and 10 in this case. This is all the function needs to construct, of course, the factors and uh, the DBMEMs because it can uh, by itself construct a series of 22 uh, 1 to 22 or 1 to 10 and then compute the DBMEMs after that. It's uh, extremely simple. Uh, as you may notice, I did not uh, put this into an object because by all pr practical means, uh, un unless you want to retain certain particular results to be used automatically by another procedure, everything uh, is directly printed on screen so you get that kind of result. And uh, you have every, everything you gave is here, plus a couple of things, uh, intermediate results. So it confirms you what you have done, uh, what you, ha you have given, so 22 and 10 uh, space and time points. Uh, number of observation, which is the product of, the, of those. The number of species, response variables here. And uh, the significance level. But because those are uh, significance level may be uh, changed here in another argument that I did not change here. So here it has computed, uh, it just appears while the computations are done, it, it comes on screen here, the DBMEMs for space and for times and uh, truncation level and so on. And it ends up instead of 22 with 10 space coding functions and uh, for the time points instead of 10 you have 4. So you end up with um, uh, really a smaller amount here of, uh, uh, of uh, well, degrees of freedom. And then it is testing, and it gives you the results. So number of space variables, it, it confirms everything here. And here I have of, uh, enlarged and highlighted in red uh, what is uh, useful, of course, here. So the R square, which is not very important uh, for, for such kind of tests, but the F statistic and the permutation result. In this case, here you see that it is highly significant. So there, there is indeed. Uh, space-time interaction in this case. If we had tested only the, 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 the design as it was, we would have uh, tested only the main factors and misinterpreted the data. Okay. And then, uh, since it is quick STI, it goes uh, beyond this, and in an appropriate way, it tests for separate spatial structures, which here are significant, and also for separate temporal st structures, which are also significant. So there is a time, an overall time effect. There is a spatial structure, meaning along the, the, fl uh, the stream, and uh, for the communities, and the modification of that spatial structure over time, or the reverse, okay? So each site doesn't uh, evolve temporally the same way. 
So uh, indeed, everything now is uh, seen here in this way completely. And this in the paper has been illustrated by uh, this little uh, layout here where actually uh, we have computed a k-means partitioning of the observations into five groups. Just to see that this whole pattern uh, varies over space and time. So the time periods are here, the first to the tenth, and the current direction, the stream, is here. So you see, for instance, that at the beginning, it's quite fairly homogeneous with only two groups appearing, one uh, at uh, quite an, uh, most places here and the second one here, so the community is here. Each symbol represents a different community. You can see it this way. And uh, when you go uh, later in the season, you see that it becomes progressively more complicated with uh, other groups appearing. Some species are no, not there anymore. Other ones appear, forming different. Here it's homogeneous. Uh, again, or almost homogeneous, but with different groups than here uh, for, the, for the greatest part. Here it breaks down again, and so on and so forth. So you really have spatial, or, oh, well, here, uh, patterns along the, the river for the community. In each case, it, it ha it, it, there is some significant uh, spatial patterns. Definitely those groups are not, uh, uh, present not themselves at random along the stream. But furthermore, they evolve through time, though. So this is a space-time interaction, as illustrated here. And the paper also presents another example derived from this famous uh, BCI forest plot, uh, the complete forest plot uh, in, uh, in Panama, on an island. Bajo BCI means uh, Bajo Colorado uh, Island. And where in those survey plots, uh, they had, uh, well, also the community or several species that they wanted to follow on uh, different uh, time steps. But here, we have uh, not the space-time representation, but for two species that grow, uh, that are associated, well, uh, three species associated with slopes, uh, uh, it's, it shows actually the map of the region and the color of those squares indicate where uh, a given species, one species here and another here, have grown or increased their uh, population or where they have lost individuals, and this is in gray. So if everything was homogeneous, it would be the same everywhere. But if, uh, as you see, there are, for instance, here, uh, most have decreased their po local population, but at some places across time, population has increased. And here also, you have all this region where this population or this species seems to have been uh, uh, favored uh, across time. So there are, there are mostly more individuals in most of those uh, subplots, whereas in this region, it's more mixed and you have uh, quite an amount of, 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 uh, of places, playsets, uh, small places, where uh, this species has actually decreased. So again, here, different um, evolution of the situation across time. Uh, and uh, so the spatial pattern evolves over time, okay? space-time interaction. Okay? Questions? Yes? Well, actually, I have one. Uh, I don't fully understand uh, how you put time uh, in the DPN. Uh, I mean, uh, I understood uh, about the symmetrical like a vector. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, two things. Technically, it's as easy as I showed you uh, during my, for my slides, okay? So obtaining DBMEMs, I don't think this is a problem for you. What is your problem is why uh, do we use DBMEMs instead of AEMs? Okay, uh, this goes back to what I quickly said just before this talk, that by, in all, uh, by all practical means, if you have uh, one dimensional, well, uh, DB, uh, Asymmetric eigenvector maps are mainly for situations where, for instance, you have a transect evolving over time. So here you have actually a, a two-dimensional layout with one dimension for space, transect across river or across a stream or something, or a current in the, in the, in the ocean or whatever, 
uh, and the other dimension being time. There, all, of course, those networks, uh, river networks that uh, Pierre uh, presented to you. So this is where AEM are really efficient. They stand out and they give better results than DBMEM. But in a unidimensional case, meaning you have one point of time followed by another, or in this case in the river where, where you have one trap and then another and then another, then the difference between AEM and DBMEM becomes non-significant. It's really practically the same. So, uh, but, of course, you, don't, you, you, you certainly don't detrain. In this case, nothing is detrained. You, you just go straight through with the DBMEM. You use time, uh, you, put, you, you create one vector uh, with one, two, three, four, five, and you run a principal coordinate analysis of, uh, well, you run the, the distance matrix, you truncate, it's exactly the process that I showed you at the beginning of my talk, exactly that. So it's that simple. Other questions? Okay, so uh, Pierre still has, uh, some elements for you to present something very important. But for me, as you know now, uh, given, the plan, uh, given the plan, this was my last, uh, last talk here for this course. So, of course, I wish to thank you for your attention, your interest, and everything we have already done together here. And I think maybe at some point, some of you will be interested not only in using those methods, but also, also in pursuing this adventure of developing num numerical methods. And people like Pierre are those kind of people that call you to an adventure and you simply cannot resist. <laughs> <laughs> so I really uh, uh, think maybe some people will Hear this call as I heard it already many years ago, uh, looking to go for this adventure. And as you know, I responded enthusiastically to it. <laughs> Reason why I'm here. So thank you, everybody. <laughs> thank you. <laughs>